Good afternoon, Joshua Walker here at Japan Society. Excited for another Tea Time. Today's guest has literally written the book, not just about what's happening today, okay, maybe not about the pandemic, but about the future of being Asia's, and also about the importance of geography. I'm particularly excited uh, to welcome my friend Prag Khanna, all the way from Singapore. Prag, how are you holding up with everything going on? Uh, Josh, great to see you, and congratulations on uh, this new position of yours at the helm of the Japan Society. Cheers uh, to you with our- Cheers, uh, Jumpai, thank you. <laughs> um, no, look, life in Singapore, I would say, uh, is, is as normal as it could be anywhere in the world because we have that mix of the urban connected environment, uh, not that anyone is using it, uh, but also obviously the green space, the trees, you know, the kind of lungs, the beach and so forth. So people are being cautious about their movements, but we have our food and, you know, all of that. And again, fresh air, being able to move around. There has been a huge spike in cases of the coronavirus, but it is uh, sadly, you know, entirely confined to the foreign worker community, which is itself geographically isolated. In terms of the population at large, the number of new cases is, is literally negligible. So, you know, for another month or so, we're going to be in this mode. But after that, I expect that Singapore is going to normalize uh, pretty, pretty quickly. What's it been like watching this whole pandemic, you know, kind of from Singapore? I mean, you talked about the Asian century. I don't know if you expected it to come this quickly. It seems that all the successful cases we see are coming from Asia, whether it's in Japan, Korea, Taiwan. Singapore has certainly been held up uh, compared to what's going on in the U.S. right now. I'm sitting in the epicenter in New York. It feels like the Asian century is already here. Uh, kind of how did that fit into your thinking on that? Well, as you know, I went to great, great lengths to kind of document how Asia's leading role models of governance, not only for Asia, but even more globally, are Asia's democracies. You know, and then when we think about Asia, we have to think much more broadly than just China. It was the rebellion against the Sinocentricity of our discourse about Asia that was one of my principal motivations for doing the book. Japan stands out, South Korea stands out, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, you know, what do they have in common, right? These are very different kinds of regimes. They are transparent, they are inclusive, they are technocratic, to a large degree democratic. Certainly when we're talking about Japan and South Korea and Taiwan, we're talking about three of the absolute gold standard democracies in the world. And I think that, you know, for better or worse, despite the tragedy of this situation, they have distinguished themselves. And I'm just very glad to see, if nothing else, that Part of the discourse around and the, and the analysis, even the introspection in the US and Europe around how the world has, or comparative reactions to handling the crisis, has finally shined a positive spotlight on Asia's democracies. And it, it's clearly a message that's extremely important to me. I mean, one of the other things you wrote right before the Asian century was about the role of technocracy and also uh, information technology and just technology in general. Uh, which is connected to what you've got behind you in terms of the map and geography. How do these things play into what's going on now? Has this crystallized even further the arguments you've made or has it kind of challenged your thinking in any way? You know, to, to put it in a simple nutshell, I was talking about the regime of the future being one that fuses data and democracy, you know, and holds them to be not necessarily equally important, but certainly not viewing them as somehow opposing forces. And part of what we've seen in terms of the lesson here is that, again, Asia's progressive regimes have embraced the role of digital technology, the contact tracing apps being the most obvious example. Now let's play this forward because we're in a bit of a race. We've got North America where the US longest border on the planet Earth is sealed right now, right, between the US and Canada. The Schengen Agreement suspended. And now you've got Asia. If we were to play a game and sort of bet which region of the world between Asia, Europe, and, the, and North America is going to open up the fastest, right? I would bet on Asia, despite the incredible heterogeneity, never having had anything like a Schengen-style agreement. Yet the technology at play and the embrace of technology and the willingness of governments to open up bilaterally to each other and say, what can we do in terms of health verification, immunity certification, and so forth at our airports, at our checkpoints, in our passports, with our customs agencies, Asians are going to get that right. There's just no question that it's not going to be politics in this region. It's going to be pragmatism because they know extremely well from the data exactly how dependent they are on visitors and travelers and business from each other's countries. 
So it's going to be a purely technocratic conversation. It's going to go in the correct direction. So I expect an incremental uh, opening to happen here relatively soon. So when you talk about kind of what's happening and kind of Asia's being the gold standard, how do you play that out with what you just described? I mean, globalization was on the rise. We've never been more connected. This pandemic has shown us how connected we are. Um, but there's a rise of nationalism as well. And it's not just what we're seeing here in the U.S. and Europe. You're seeing it in Asia as well as all the countries have begun to shut down. How does that play out in terms of the rise of nationalism? Is there a particularly unique Asian characteristic that might guide us in a way that in the past European or American forms of nationalism? So I think we have three things going on here that are worth, you know, juxtaposing and synthesizing where relevant. One is connectivity, which is flourishing like never before. If you think about the internet, right? I mean, we, now we realize that we need to invest more in broadband. We've got more data services and, and, you know, more global communication going on in many ways than before. So connectivity as an infrastructural investment that gets utilized to a greater or lesser degree we're still gonna invest in connectivity because we need it. It's a form of resilience. Think about food uh, shipments and shipments of medical supplies and science diplomacy. All of that is globalization too, even if there's zero migration right now, even if supply chains are decoupling. But now let's get to globalization. We were regionalizing in terms of manufacturing supply chains well before the coronavirus, right? It, even before the trade war, but the trade war accelerated it. So from 2016 to 2019, we had this period where North America became much more regionally integrated. Even as Trump was bashing NAFTA, U.S. trade with Canada surpassed $300 billion. U.S. trade with Mexico surpassed $300 billion. U.S. trade with China fell to $270 billion, right? Europe, 70% internal trade, Asia, 60 plus percent internal trade. So we've been moving towards regionalism in those particular metrics of supply chains and so forth for a long time. It has nothing to do with the coronavirus, but the coronavirus will accelerate it for sure, right? So we'll have intra-regional nearshoring, no doubt about it. Nationalism then. How can one talk about nationalism as being synonymous with borders going up when nationalism in Asia also means uh, you know, integrating supply chains more with your neighbors to get more business and export more to them. How can we, on the one hand, say, oh, Asia is turning nationalistic and then point out that, oh, well, they've just passed, you know, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, largest trading zone on the planet Earth last year. So nationalism, quite frankly, as we generically understand it, is not necessarily antithetical to globalization, to opening to regionalism, not at all. Part of what, you know, in a way um, is part and parcel of this nationalism is the sense that, you know, we are, you know, we want to strengthen our economy. I, as a leader, have a long-term vision for, national, for, for modernization. That's going to involve, actually, being much more open economically. Uh, so, the, the, you know, we, I think nationalism is just far too broad, brushstroke a term. And quite frankly, as, as uh, people started to comment on, in the case of Europe, prior to the pandemic, the same governments that we identified as being hyper-nationalistic, like Hungary and Italy, A, they weren't exactly role models to begin with. B, they were very much on the ropes, uh, you know, as a result of just their own economic failings. So I don't put a lot of stock in us. You know, I think we abuse the term more than it's useful for. So what's interesting is, you know, obviously in the U.S., we're focused on the 2020 elections and everything is a referendum on President Trump. Um, we see other strong leaders, maybe positive and negative. You just mentioned uh, Viktor Orban of Hungary, who kind of used this crisis to jump in. When you look at this big picture, where do you weigh in on the debate about a post-COVID world, about America's role relative to China? You talked about Asia being the future, but you also talked about heterogeneity and how different countries. So what does the post-COVID world look like? Is it the same as pre-COVID or is it somehow different with this pandemic? I mean, a lot of trends will accelerate, and the most important one being this, uh, you know, sort of diffusion of geopolitical power, this entropy, if you will, into the into regions, right? So we're clearly not in a unipolar world. We're not in a world where China is going to be number one. Obviously, that's an argument I've been making for a long time. Um, and, and not only is the world multipolar across these regions, but even Asia is multipolar. And for me, Japan has always been very central to this argument, as is India increasingly. 
in addition to obviously other uh, you know, regional powers like South Korea, Australia, and so forth. So to me, to properly understand the global landscape, you have to appreciate that A, it's multi-regional and multipolar at the global scale, and that Asia itself as a region that is a mega region that's far larger and more populous and more distributed in terms of its heterogeneity of civilizations um, is itself multipolar. So you have a multipolarity within a multipolarity. And that again has been the grave oversight. And uh, to me, if you put this in the context of, of geopolitics as it's evolving, again, things like uh, the responses to China's Belt and Road, like Japan and India's cooperation around the connectivity corridors, the EU's Asia Connectivity Initiative, the US Australia Blue Dot Network, all of these responses show that you're going to have and uh, what I call the infrastructure arms race. And again, Japan is so pivotal, India is so pivotal in assuring that the, your, the, that the Asian landscape returns to the multipolarity that is really characterized most of its 4,000 years of, of history. Uh, so I think that is, again, trends that have been underway for a few years now and becoming more and more apparent. And uh, I think that the suspicion, obviously, of China being uh, as high as it has been and obviously elevated now as a result of uh, its handling of the virus will only ensure in a way that that becomes the case. So I have to ask you, obviously, as Japan society, you talked about Japan's unique role. I'd love for you to unpack that. And then also you talked about the Indo-Pacific idea that's only recently caught on here, but seemingly has been driving a lot of the discussions kind of in the non-Chinese uh, world in Asia. Can you kind of talk about how that fits into your thinking here? I mean, let me, let me also back up then if we're going to look at Japan, because I always say that, you know, if you think about the last 30 years of post-Cold War history, and we think about the efforts around modernization of Asia, the foreign investment landscape uh, in Asia, infrastructure finance in Asia, all of that is led by Japan, right? Japan has been in the lead in that regard for the better part of three decades. And China has strengthened its role. And it's what China, what China is doing in many ways is contributing to a broader effort around Asian infrastructural modernization, connectivity, and so forth. But much of that builds on what Japan has already done. It's not necessarily contradictory per se. There can be bilateral competition for influence in certain countries, but we can't say that, that you know, it's Japan versus China or America versus China. So often, you know, I, I try to reject whenever possible the notion that great powers are carving up, you know, spheres of influence. That's a very feigned attempt at, you know, sort of grandiose 19th century, you know, even mid 20th century kind of logic. That's not the way the world works anymore. You know, all of these other countries have a voice, a very powerful voice. And most of them, of course, far prefer you know, leaning on Japan when possible to any other country. You know, as you know, Japan enjoys a, a, a sterling reputation across uh, the region and across the world. So as I say, Japan's role has been preeminent uh, and, and remains very significant. And then again, the Indo-Pacific, as you mentioned, the quad arrangement is part and parcel um, of this broader infrastructure arms race, as well as you know, distribution of power, where you see Japan, Australia, India, the US collaborating more on defense uh, agreements and maneuvering, and then providing that support uh, to the littoral states of the South China Sea, such as uh, Indonesia, Vietnam, and the Philippines. That's another example of how, you know, to me, even if it's tentative, hesitant, uh, it's a reminder that A, well before the Obama administration articulated a pivot to Asia, well before you know, the Trump administration uh, you know, wanted to say step up militarily more uh, in the region, or pursue burden sharing, or or you know push for burden sharing, um, depending on which ally we're talking about. In the case of Taiwan, obviously stepping up support. In the case of South Korea and Japan, demanding more burden sharing. Either way, Japan and India and the the powers in the region were well aware of the need to craft this Indo-Pacific kind of uh, strategy and work together on it. U.S. support is very welcome and very necessary, no doubt about it. But I think that, again, the Quad is yet another example of how there's a natural awareness of how a default multipolarity is the more stable form of power structure in the region. Now, again, that does tend to fly in the face of Western international relations theory, where we do have a bit of this bias towards unipolar orders. Um, it, that's a huge misconception when applied to Asia. It's Well, let me be more blunt. It's wrong. 
right? For the majority of the human population, multipolar orders have been more stable because I'm talking about Asia. So when we craft these theories with no reference to the majority of the human population and human history, we're clearly indulging in a bit of oversight. Uh, so I think that, again, there is this Japanese intuition, this Indian intuition, that we need to reference far more prominently when we're kind of thinking about uh, what a stable structure looks like. And again, I think Japan and India are on the right track here. All right, before I let you go, I have to ask, because you've written all these books and you're always about a decade ahead of the curve on some things. What are you working on right now? Kind of what, what's the next big thing for Akana? Well, it might take a decade for this to prove correct, but I've actually uh, finished my next book and I finished it uh, exactly two months ago. Um, it's actually about the future of human geography. And note the incredible irony because what we are living through right now is the world's first completely simultaneous standstill and halt of cross-border human migration. Literally today, Donald Trump said he's going to issue this executive order to you know, block, stop all immigration to the United States. We've never had something like this. And he, here I am, just finished a book about the future of human migration. And it's going to be, to quote, I don't know, it's going to be huge. <laughs> you know, the, 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 the volumes of migration that I'm anticipating, uh, driven by, in reverse order in a way, the pandemic and people waking up and saying, you know, I live in a red zone, get me out of here. Uh, climate change, which is not stopping, uh, even if air pollution has slowed down a little bit. Um, obviously, uh, labor, uh, d labor automation and economic dislocation, enormous factors now more than ever as a result of the pandemic. Political unrest and upheaval, right? We've already had lots of civil wars and governments collapsing. We're going to have more of that now. And then just demographic imbalances between old and young. So there are six major drivers of human migration. All of them are actually full throttle in terms of their fundamental uh, power, in a way, or, or motivation, they're just being artificially suppressed right now. So I'm, I finished this kind of book kind of forecasting what the future of human geography is going to be 10 years, 15 years out, and how we get there. So it'll be so interesting to watch that story unfold as the pandemic fog kind of lifts. So that's, that's the next book. Well, Prakana, you're always one step ahead of us. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope at some point in time, we'll get to welcome you to New York and our members can meet you. But in the meantime, we'll continue to follow your work and just thank you for all you're doing. Good to talk to you. Likewise, you likewise, likewise. Be well, take care. Thank you.